Uh, welcome everyone and thanks for joining our session on Digital Twin for Downstream. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning to you, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Seth Taylor and I'll be moderating today's session. I'm calling in from, uh, from the United States where I work for Chevron's Technical Center uh, as a product owner for Digital Twin Technologies and also as an advisor for Enterprise Digital Twin Strategy. Uh, so I'm based at our El Segundo refinery in California. Uh, I'm quite familiar with opportunities and challenges in connecting digital twin technology to uh, downstream manufacturing facilities. Uh, I'm joined today by four outstanding panelists who will bring uh, some deep domain expertise, as well as uh, fairly broad industry experience to this topic. So let me uh, introduce them brief briefly before we launch into the discussion. Uh, Luke Kendall joins us from Shell, where he is Digital Program Manager for Shell Norway. Luke has experience across the oil and gas value chain, uh, and in his current role is helping Shell figure out how to scale digital twin technology and connect it to the entire supply chain from reservoir to market. Shane McArdle is a Senior Vice President for Digital Energy Division at Kongsberg Digital. Uh, in this role, he works closely with customers to define what a digital twin can do for them in light of their digital maturity and business needs. Uh, Basim Khan joins us from McDermott, where he is Global Vice President of Digital and Analytics, as well as Head of Innovation. He's responsible for developing and deploying innovative technologies, products and processes to transform McDermott's project delivery practices. And finally, Harold Vessenberg is an experienced software innovator for Equinor with more than 20 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. Uh, he was instrumental in driving Equinor's early digital twin development activities, uh, serving as product owner of their first digital twin delivered in 2019. Now at Equinor's Research Center in Trondheim, he's technical lead for blockchain initiatives. Welcome to all of you, and thanks for sharing some of your time and insights with, uh, with us in the audience today. <clears throat> so let's get into some of the topics that people want uh, to learn more about, the, the why and how aspects of Digital Twin, and specifically Digital Twin for Downstream. And Luke, I thought it might, uh, you might be a good person to start the discussion. Uh, by sharing some of your thoughts on what digital twin mean uh, digital twin means to shell uh, why the company is moving aggressively in this space and and perhaps why now yeah no good questions um so first of all thank you for inviting me today and it's great to be with some uh, some fantastic peers from other companies so so for shell digital twins um it's been a hot topic, I think, for Shell for the last three or four years. Um, it's certainly started quite aggressively over uh, um, about 24 months ago in our, in our, certainly our upstream assets, where we're currently rolling out digital twins for uh, multiple assets. I believe, though, you know, when we when we kind of transpose that to the different the, the, the value chain downstream, we start to see a really kind of in, a compelling uh, business value proposition. I think you know, legacy looking. If you uh, if you take the complexities of a downstream refinery or a, chemi a chemical installation, um, it's much more complex than we have to deal with in the upstream. Um, therefore, you know, implementing um, digital twins in this space offers an array of value. And I think you know the biggest one here is about integrating people um, and with their plant and integrating uh, uh, each of them factories with, within them with, within the plant to each other. And I believe, you know, that that's uh, currently where we are in Shell. So we, we you know, we proudly begun in the upstream. And we then began rolling out in the midstream. And now we're really pushing about the rolling out digital, digital twins and our downstream assets as well. So we're trying to integrate the whole value chain. So maybe that's a good kickoff for them. Yeah, great. Thanks, Luke. Uh, Shane, so <laughs> as a technology provider to the industry and someone who works uh, with many different end users, you surely have a unique perspective on value creation. Where do you and your customers see uh, some of the most compelling opportunities to derive value from Digital Twin? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I suppose I just want to ad address the first point you made. You know, there are many different end users of the technology that we have. And, and what surprises me a bit is every single one thinks they have a unique challenge. Right, and and what what we end up uh, being able to educate or share is it's actually not that unique. So regardless of your sector, whether it's upstream, downstream, or part of the value chain, 
sorry, or regardless of your sector, whether it's like new energies or offshore wind or, or uh, you know, your pure play oil and gas facility, um, the challenges are very much the same. So, uh, so that was an interesting realization. Um, a lot of a lot of where we see the opportunities are, it's it's this unification of you know data and people. You know, everyone talks about you know uh, the value of data, and, and there are a lot of challenges around that uh, to solve. First of all, but it's about making sure that you put put the right and correct data into people's hands, and this is where the innovative uh, part of the process starts, and this is where you start uh, driving a lot of value. So uh, the approach we take is think of it from an end user perspective, regardless of uh, who, what type of persona they are, what, what part of the value chain they are in. Um, you can say you know, maintenance point of view, right? So what, what is it you want to improve? Are there efficiency gains to how you do your job day to day? How do you embed these workflows into what we call a Cogni Twin or Digital Twin? Um, can we leverage some of the analytics uh, that people have been working with for the last five, six years. And, and there, there's a huge benefit to be gained going from, I suppose, this proof of concept. There's so many proof of concepts that are run in our industry today. Uh, and, and the problem with that is that it, 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 they rarely go from a proof of concept to proof of scale. So there's a lot of value to be achieved at scaling out these uh, proof of concepts that have been successful. Um, uh, again, these have varied from... Uh, maintenance optimization uh, to production optimization to energy uh, nomination uh, in improvements to turnaround optimization. There's so many areas where where digitalization, data analytics um, can just bring value. So and, and, and they're common, as I said, they're common challenges to many many parts of the of the value chain. Another area which was, I suppose, I don't want to say unforeseen, but it was um, how much value provided was was unexpected was just getting your arms and legs around that data challenge, you know, just having uh, clean, being able to transfer your data into something that's clean and useful and actually provide insights. You know, a lot a lot of the customers come to us and go, oh, look, we can't start this digital journey. It's just not possible. We're, we're, too, we're too old, we have a too old refinery or our data isn't in, in, a, in a format or a system that, that's readily accessible. And then when we can show hey, actually we can democratize that data or break open that silo and put it in context with other pieces of data. It's like this light bulb moment and, and so many people just go, oh my God, this saves me four, five, six hours every day trying to contact colleagues, look into various systems. So again, this is a very common uh, challenge that we solve uh, and derives a lot of value very early on and very quickly. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, so so uh, Harold, Shane touched on a couple points there that I think probably resonate with a lot of the folks uh, calling in today around uh, challenges getting your arms around all the relevant data. Uh, how do you scale? How do you derive value from from perhaps POCs that might be inherently not scalable? Can you give us a little bit of insight on Equinor's uh, journey in this space and, and as uh, at least perhaps from the software side, uh, what were some of the approaches you took uh, to, to start to address uh, and, and consider the scalability aspects of, of Digital Twin. Yeah, thank you, Seth. And, and once again, also thank you for inviting me to this panel. I think uh, one of the uh, interesting choices that Equinor has made is that we have chosen to build our own um, Digital Twin. So uh, not that there is anything wrong with any of the commercially available digital twins, but we we wanted to be in control of the development in <clears throat> in our own uh, of our own digital twins, so that we could prioritize uh, which uh, capabilities we wanted to build into uh, into our twin, um, and that means that uh, it integrates fairly closely with our uh, Equinor data platform. Some of you may have heard about Omnia, which is our Azure-based data platform, uh, and which is where we collect all of the data that we, or most of the data that we need, um, in addition to all of the different uh, underlying systems that we pick up data from. Uh, and that gave us the very uh, a very good uh, uh, opportunity to prioritize what we felt was important. So we built our digital twin on top of the Unity uh, gaming platform. 
uh, which means that, for instance, we can have a multiplayer experience. So if you are uh, running our digital twin on your HoloLens or some other tool out in the out in the plant, you can invite people from their desktop into the same digital twin model, and you can collaborate around the, around a piece of equipment or a piece of the model, and also then maybe also look at it together uh, through the view of the. Uh, HoloLens um, and all of these um, experiences have been built kind of uh, slowly. We started out with some really simple prototypes, but then we got real business backing. There were some real business pull, uh, and that meant that we could prioritize what the and the, the users found important and and make sure that we delivered on something they needed. And that, of course, increased. Uh, uh, that increased our probability of, of being able to scale because people really wanted what we were building. And, and as a software engineering being used to running uh, workshops um, uh, with users, it was quite a different thing to run user requirements workshops on the oil rigs and in the refineries because that gave us a whole different kind of insight into what the users wanted and it was easy to go out and see if there was something we were curious about or, or wondered how was how we were supposed to solve great thanks harold uh vasim before we leave the, the topic of uh of value i wanted to circle back with you and uh get some of your perceptions uh you know within the downstream segment especially uh where are your clients seeing value currently an opportunity in embracing digital twin technology. Can you comment a bit a bit on that? Yeah, and thanks again, thank you for having me on this panel. So unlike uh, some of the colleagues on the uh, on the call, we are um, not an operator, we are a project delivery company. So our focus is on how do we deliver projects, um, obviously safely, but on time and on schedule. So what our clients are looking for is how do we get information to them to at the right time and in a manner that it is useful for them. So our digital twin, or our view of a digital twin is how do we take data, convert the data into information, and then using domain knowledge, convert the information into actionable insight. How do we essentially look around corners? Um, what we are looking at is, in, and this has just been accelerated by COVID-19, but it would have happened anyway, is how do we operate projects remotely? So how do we um, show a client sitting halfway around the world how the project is actually progressing? So our view of what we are doing is we're taking market um, software packages, things like Aviva, Hexagon, and Bentley, and may, we are marrying these engineering-focused 3D design packages with a PLM, a product lifecycle tool. So product lifecycle tools are very common in the, um, in the manufacturing industry. But what we're doing is we're taking a PLM, and in our case, it's a DASO systems PLM. We're marrying it with a 3D tool. So it allows us to create for the project a single source of truth. It's not dissimilar to what Equinor has done in its recent offshore projects. But what we're trying to do is pulling together not just engineering and technical information, but progress information, um, inspection information. And I think most importantly for us is we're managing tasks um, in the system as well. So create an ecosystem, which is a single source of truth, do away with the Excel spreadsheets, and bring robustness to delivery. So the question you ask, Seth, is what are your clients looking for? What our clients are looking for is a robust delivery model where um, a project is delivered on time, um, on budget, and to the specifications that the uh, clients are looking for. Now, let's go one step further. So now that the digital twin has been built, uh, it has all of the information you need to be able to uh, build the plant, but it also has all of the information you need to operate the plant. And one of the key parts of what it's looking for is dynamic simulation. Now, dynamic simulation is obviously important in upstream industries. But when you go to a downstream industry, a petrochemical plant, a refinery, where very small changes in uh, the feedstock composition can have a, a significant effect on energy consumption, 
um, where you can optimize half a percent, one a percent, one percent of your energy uh, and therefore reduce your OPEX. That is where the digital twin really comes into its own. It's not something we do. We're not a plant operator, but we build or we, we, we wish to build the infrastructure, the nuts and bolts of a digital twin that allows our clients to better operate their facilities. And um, all of that is basically the correct use of information because, you know, information in isolation is a really a very limited benefit. Information which results in actionable insight is what our clients are looking for. And that's what we believe a digital twin will truly deliver um, in the downstream industry. Now, tie all of this, why are we trying to do this? A reduction in energy consumption, which is what a lot of the downstream industry is looking at, or a reduction in your downtime is a reduction in uh, carbon emissions. If I can produce the same amount of product with 5% less um, energy, uh, I'm reducing carbon emissions by an equivalent amount. Um, so that's what that's where a digital twin ties back into decarbonization, improve efficiency of operations by using data, by taking insights uh, from the digital twin, reduce carbon emissions, improve the bottom line. Yeah, that's brilliant, Vasim. You, you touched on another number of topics there that are certainly, um, you know, valuable to the industry. Uh, I, I circled actionable insight because I think that's one that a lot of resonates with a lot of people. Obviously, the the dollar savings is a key thing for for downstream as well. Uh, inherent in in some of the things you're talking about is the ability of a, of a facility or a site to to have sufficient di digital maturity to catch these technologies. Uh, you brought that up in the context of, of projects. Uh, it's also true for on the operations side. And I thought it might be useful just talking a little bit about um, how the, the journey to develop, implement, utilize uh, digital twin, you know, how you deal with the, uh, uh, how, how panelists have dealt with the fact that digital, uh, different facilities may have different levels of digital maturity. Luke, do you want to maybe comment a bit on uh, Shell's approach to addressing um, how Digital Twin is being um, implemented and utilized in light of perhaps different levels of digital maturity across different different sites or different types of facilities. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and another great question, by the way, um, because I think you know Shane brought this up earlier. When we will come, we've got assets in Shell that have got fantastic data, and then we've got assets in Shell that haven't got so much fantastic data. Um, their ambitions for digitalization are different across our different asset portfolios, depending on depending on the, uh, where the maturity is of the assets. We you know we've got assets that are a few years old. We've also got assets that are almost 100 years old. So um, how is Digital Twin helping us? Well, the, you know, the Digital Twin where we've got the really mature assets, uh, the, the digitally mature assets that are savvy and ready to go, um, we're seeing them making really fast leaps and bounds. Um, and uh, you know they're they're really nailing all the benefits that we, I think you just you just you just heard uh, from my colleague, um, ranging from optimization of, of energy production of, and just or just good collaboration. However, we've also got assets that are benefiting from digital twins who don't have good data quality. Um, how does it do it? So, uh, the, and I I think the the main way is that once you've contextualized your data and you can compare it across. Multi, mul multiple data sources, we know a lot of our data becomes siloed. So when you start to compare, the integrate it and compare it across siloed, you start to weed out the bad data. Um, once it's visualized, you're able to act on it. You're able to improve your data. So we found that digital twins are actually helping us accelerate uh, an opportunity to improve our digital maturity, our data maturity, and our data readiness in, in, in many, many of our assets. And the more we do it, the better we get at it. Um, you know, moving from a, a, a top class uh, um, country like Norway, where data standards is just ingrained in people, to to maybe some assets um, somewhere else that are, 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 are more um, are more leaning on towards the technology to help them, we see that the the, the speed of uh, data maturity is is increasing uh, in, in in step changes rather than in incremental steps. So it's really really uh, beneficial. Um, 
I think, you know, if we if we look back over that, certainly over the last year, um, the, the benefit of that replication will continue um, that we've, we've seen. And I think we will see that accelerate as we roll out to even meet even more mature assets that we'll start to see a, a, an alignment of, of our digital twins across the different across the different uh, lines of business and value chains. So um, exciting. Thank you. That's interesting. You seem to be suggesting that there's a acceleration process that comes with uh, once there's an adoption and implementation of the technology uh, to and and perhaps that's not anticipated initially when you go into go into the process and and look at what level of complexity or what level of uh, uh, maturity am I able to take on initially? That's very interesting, Sh Shane. I'm, I'm I'm curious if you have a uh, a perspective on that based on you know. Uh, Kongsberg's interactions with customers in this space. Yeah, definitely. Um, no one asset is the is the same. That you know, that's absolutely for sure. Uh, but as I, as I as I mentioned, the the challenges are quite common. There's quite common challenges around, which we 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 try to build. And again, we're not an operator, but what we're trying to do is build build a tool uh, that can allow you to operate smarter and better and more sustainable. So. <laughs> It's about taking those manual processes that you probably have experienced in any proof of concept you've done in the last four to five years and codifying it, putting it into software. So it just becomes an off the shelf solution. So uh, just to allude there to, to what Luke said, you know, this, this, this accelerates. So regardless of what asset, uh, mature, what maturity and uh, digital maturity an asset has, uh, just by having a lot of these work processes um, codified, it, it, it leapfrogs uh, where where the where the business uh, thinks they can start and, and pushes them into a let's say phase two before before they even think they're even ready for that. So uh, that that's one experience that we've seen that um, having this having this tool that's built to automate away a lot of these manual processes, uh, having the ability to, I suppose. Um, embed work processes in the twin right that's that's fundamentally important because that that's where you see a lot of these efficiency gains as well and and they're common you know so if, if we we work very closely with our customers to to develop use cases and 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 that that isn't just siloed with that user or that specific asset uh within that user's portfolio then this becomes available throughout the whole uh portfolio play it becomes available to all of our customers so we're, we're very fortunate in that sense that um it, we're able to change and and push the industry through the deeper integration that we have with, with, with the end users. Because again, uh, you know, a, a pump on a downstream facility is similar to a pump on, you know, an upstream asset. And anything, any of the use cases or workflow enablement that we build there uh, is uh, replicable across uh, the value chain. Um, one interesting part that we saw as well was the reduced IT costs. And this, this was a bit of an interesting one and completely unexpected was as we started to uh, work closely with the end users and they started to see some of these uh, enabled workflows or digitalized workflows, they started thinking, hey, actually, I don't need this other application. We can continue to use it as a system of record, for example. Uh, we're not there to replace that. We're, we're more a digital integrator. Um, uh, but we don't actually need uh, to use maybe all, all of the capabilities or bells and whistles there. So they start seeing a significant reduction in their IT costs. We didn't set out to do that. And this was something that the, the business itself learned. So that, that was that was very unexpected and actually uh, a nice uh, benefit that we start seeing there as well. And then obviously the improved efficiency just in, in various activities. Again, uh, this is very linked to, I mean, one particular example is a energy optimization a facility we have in Norway. It's all electrified. Uh, you know, if you can optimize the electricity uh, usage there by one to two percent, it's it's representative of about a thousand households or a use of a thousand households in, in in Norway. So over a year, so that may seem like a small incremental change, but it has a significant impact actually uh, within the bigger picture. So yeah, lots of quick wins uh, can be realized quicker than people think. Uh, you can start at any level. Uh, you know, you don't have to just wait and then take this in a big bite. So you can start small, uh, but with the thinking of scalability behind it. Um, we like to do this kind of iterative approach where you go, okay, what's the business case? Because everything has to have a purpose. You, you don't want to just digitalize for the for the sake of it, you know, just because it's a nice shiny thing. You want to have a business case linked to it. And you go, okay, 
a very simple approach there is go, okay, what types of data sources are linked to this business case that you want to achieve, right? So you go, okay, we can aggregate all of these. We can unify that data, put it in context. We can then look at um, uh, the users. Uh, we can work through uh, the workflow that they typically do, and we can see, okay, is there areas to completely change how you work? Can we automate it all away, for example? Um, or are there efficiently gains that we can just build into that? And then you can start adding in your other bells and whistles, like you know maybe iPads or wearables. So there's lots you can do. Uh, and our experience is that you can leapfrog a lot quicker than people think. You know, you can be spending a year thinking about starting this, and then you can see the value realization very, very quickly. And people go, "Why didn't we start this a year ago?" So it's uh, it's fun to get that reaction, but it can also be frustrating in getting these projects up and running as well. Yeah. For sure. Well, you cut, you touched on a, a number of points there, uh, a couple of which I'd like to come back to. Uh, one of them was workflow enablement, the other one being cost. Uh, so let's start with the workflow enablement one, because I, I think that's a really key aspect of what we ask and hope a digital twin will do is enable enable workflows to, to happen faster and with, with more confidence. Uh, and a lot of times the MVPs or, or proof of concepts that we do are designed to, to as you say, um, verify a business case and show the ability to connect to a workflow. Uh, certainly from, from our own experience within Chevron in, in proof of concepts or early stage work that we've done, you know, we will target a, a small facility uh, or aspect of a facility and say, we want to demonstrate something here. Uh, there was there was a comment earlier in the discussion about is is that a valid approach? There, there, are, there are certainly uh, learnings that can be de derived from that. There's also challenges and shortcomings associated with it when you when you target just one one region or portion of a of a larger unit or plant or facility or refinery. And so I wanted to to circle back with with uh, some folks and just talk through in their own journeys. And, and Harold, I might direct this question to you. Um, you know, Equinor <clears throat> worked towards demonstrating their first digital twin a couple years ago. Uh, did you embrace the concept of starting with uh, a, a proof of concept and progressing through larger stages uh, of scope yeah. and maturity to get to your first year implementation? Can you talk us through that a bit? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I can uh, certainly start out. Um, we uh, we started out with a, a digital twin project. Uh, I think it was the summer of. I get my years mixed up in this COVID time, but I think it was around the summer of 2018, um, and that meant that uh, in the during and then we spent some time planning and, and working through what did we want with our digital twin, uh, and then we made a, a prototype, a prototype for an, for iOS or iPads. Um, and that took only a few weeks, uh, which gave us insight into what it would take to to drive the 3D models on an iPad. Did we have sufficient quality? What does it take to 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 run the to to transform the 3D models into something that can run on an iPad, which it doesn't natively do uh, if you take it from your 3D CAD system. Um, and then based on that we saw that gave us a good impression of what it would take we couldn't say from the prototype uh, that it would work but it gave us a very good impression of, of what it would take to get something that scaled to to whatever we needed it to do and and uh, and what kind of data qualities we were looking for and i think this is um important uh, learning for a lot of people in this uh, when when the project managers of the oil industry meet the software innovators of the software world uh, is that as a software innovator as a software engineer it's very everything we do we do probably for the first time so we don't really know what it will take to do it so the value of these prototypes is for us to gain more insight into what will it take to get this to scale what are the requirements because we can then verify continuously against working software um, and that has proven to be very useful and then we developed after we started the the full scale development the we uh, we uh, had releases uh, every yeah, we released to test users every month and created uh, good uh, 
uh, a good working relationship with the end users so they could continuously look at what we were doing. And then we released version one of our digital twin about six months after we started development uh, in the fall of uh, 2019. And that was, uh, I think, perhaps the, the, and then we have continued to develop the digital twins. So and now it has a lot more capabilities uh, compared to what it could do. Because in the beginning, what it would do was that you had a 3D model you could navigate in, either on your iPad, on your laptop, or, or on your desktop, or in a HoloLens type uh, variable. And then you could use that to look up documentation from uh from our technical information systems uh, and search for equipment in the out in the facility and since then we have hooked up to the to the industrial or not directly to the industrial control systems but to the, to the data from the uh, industrial control systems and we have brought more and more information into the digital twin so that it becomes easier to 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 use it and it gives more context to the data and this journey of gradually taking steps proving value uh, delivering to the end users looking for feedback and going back changing delivering changing delivering i think that that uh, journey from the small prototype that we developed in two weeks to the full-scale uh, team that is working on it now has shown the, the value of taking small steps and learning from that because everything is unknown when you start out. And and Harold, if I can just follow up on that briefly. So did, did Equinor, um, had they already committed to the technology in that uh, process that you were describing? Were you expecting to see business value delivered at certain steps or, or iterations in your process? Or was there already commitment, and it was just a matter of figuring out how to how to deliver uh, capabilities yeah. in the right order and at the right level of, of uh, maturity? I, I think in the beginning, it was a lot about uh, making sure that the technology worked. So it was a lot of technology experimentation. How do we uh, deal with it? We started out with some small installations, but then, of course, when you go into the bigger uh, our biggest installation is at the moment is uh, Johan Svaldup, which is um, five platforms, I think, um, and uh, making sure that uh, that we could actually scale to the to the level that we needed it to do, and and then as we uh, continue to show that this was possible, we got more and more commitment from from senior management because they had a very clear vision for where they wanted to go but they didn't commit to everything uh, at once they kind of committed to to taking the next step and the next step and the next step and as we were learning what the next step would be we could also give a pretty good uh, overview of what that next step would entail uh, and then we could get commitment to that and then of course as you get further down the road it becomes more and more difficult to to give up but we did never get more commitment uh, than to the next phase that we could sh that we knew what and then that where we knew what we could be uh, we were able to do uh, in the development great and i, I apologize i'm at a, a, a bit of a disadvantage as moderator and not being able to see other panelists during these uh uh responses but if if uh, is anyone else keen to jump in on the topic of um you know how much to bite and chew off in an initial uh uh, initial part of this this implementation process, the this and, and the so-called scaling strategy for for implementation. I mean, at McDermott, if I can just jump in here again, ours is a slightly different situation. But you know, one of the challenges we've got is that technology should not be the proverbial hammer looking for a nail, right? It needs to have a purpose, and the purpose needs to be. The question we ask ourselves is what is the problem we're trying to solve and what is the value that the solution tech, tech, uh, digital solution proposed brings to it so it's almost like we do a value proposition first then go into a proof of concept which we typically want to run parallel to the normal work process on one of our projects so we have real comparative data 
And once we can prove that, we go into the scale part. Now, the value proposition part, the way we work this, it should not be an exercise of more than uh, two to four weeks, but it absolutely demands a very clear statement on what is the problem you're trying to solve. What is the, you know, the, the fiscal value, the money value that we will um, bring a solution to? That's a paper exercise. That's a, a, that's a, a desktop exercise. Once we've proven to ourselves that here is a problem that technology can solve and it's worth solving, it's not the proverbial, I've got a beautiful technology, look, let me go find a problem to apply it on. Then we will go to what we have an innovation council in the company and the innovation council green lights the, uh, the, proof, of, uh, uh, the proof of concept, applied on a real project running in parallel to the normal work processes. That should not take more than six months, and then we'll scale it. And the scaling part is the challenge, because in a sense, you mentioned culture. Our industry, with a few exceptions, and I, I do acknowledge that Equinor is probably one of the, the, one of the best exceptions, is extremely conservative. Um, it, it, it's, it does not want to change how we have done things. So convincing operations, because let's face it, they are the end users, right? convincing operations to change their work processes of 25, 30 years and to use a new tool, knowing full well that that tool is actually going to improve efficiency. And let's face it, that means um, you know, fewer people on the ground. That's our biggest challenge. Um, it's a challenge which we're overcoming by means of education, but uh, that is our biggest challenge, Seth. It's culture. You know, if you look at, uh, if you look at how we do work, it's processes, people, and technology, technology and tools. Technology is a necessary but not sufficient condition. We need to get the people part and the process part right before we're going to really be able to successful, successfully implement technology. Yeah, for sure. Those are, those are great points, Faseem. And, and uh, change management, uh, embracing new things is, is certainly something uh, the industry struggles with based on that conservatism. Um, th there's also, obviously, uh, because we're businesses and, and downstream being uh, at, in, in locations, um, you know, margin business, tight margin business, a keen focus on cost. And a, a number of folks have talked about uh, value capture, value delivery, uh, the ability to reduce costs with digital twin implementation. And clearly, the reason we're all participating here today is believe that we believe there's a lot of opportunity to reduce costs uh, in projects and operations with the technology. There's also a cost to implement, and and so one of the things I wanted to 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 get uh, to probe and discuss with 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 the four of you is how does the cost to implement shape strategy um, either as a technology provider and, and in discussions with your customers uh, or as a you know benefactor and customer of the technology and how you uh, plan and, and strategize for for implementation of the technology um, so it's, it's an open question um, Sh Shane I'll maybe I'll start with you uh, for, as a technology provider and then and then we'll move on to uh, maybe the Luke from Shell. No, I, it's it, yeah. Obviously, as a technology provider, we're coming from a different point of view. So, so for us, we we, we try to run uh, a very lean uh, MVP with, with, our, with our customers. So we try to do this uh, very very fast, very lean. So we're very conscious of the cost element for the customers. Um, where we're going to see profitability, obviously, is 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 the number of users. So if we do our job well. Uh, we're going to get more users, and uh, and and Luke often talks about. Uh, I know Luke uh, often talks about. Um, you know, it's like it's like kids with iPads. You know, when, when you have something like a digital twin, it's like one kid playing on an iPad and another kid looking over the shoulder and going, "Hey, I like this." And then you have another kid, and it, it spreads. If if and so, a lot of what we focus on is we design for our users' needs, right? Uh, and that's so fundamentally important. And I've seen you're, you're, you're correct in, in one sense that, you know, technology is, is an enabler. Uh, it, 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 you don't want to be using it as a hammer, but you have to build flexibility and the experience in there. Because if you don't have a good experience with it, you're not going to get the scalability. You're going to have just this big resistance to adoption of this, of this technology. So it's hand in hand with the people change uh, and the design of the technology. 
Um, always, always, always we start with the business case, right? It, it has to be uh, purposely uh, implemented for to solve something, right? But you have to be ready to pivot because what we what we realize is, you know, there's a lot of on paper designing. We think digitalization is going to solve this, and you know, a lot of thinking gone into it. And then when you actually start the process, you realize, hey, actually, th this isn't really going to turn out the way we think it is. And so it's it's this fail fast mentality, you know, and being able to pivot. And, and move the technology uh, or direct it towards somewhere else. Where maybe you see as one of these sprint cycles, you see, hey, actually, the experience we're getting here, which was unexpected, is, is much better. And the outcome is going to have maybe bigger cost savings or a better impact on my overall uh, profitability. Uh, and you have to be able to pivot it during that stage. And, and this is where it becomes very uh, smart to to run in an agile approach uh with a lean organization and a tight integration with the with the people but always with the possible or with the focus on um end business out outcome and the capability to pivot if you see things changing very good thanks shane and, and luke maybe you know a similar question to you and and maybe a different way of, of phrasing it is is when you prioritize or look at which facilities to uh, get the technology next is hmm. is the cost to implement the primary uh, factor in that consideration, or are you you're, you're balancing multiple factors? And if so, what are those? You know, it's, you know ultimately it's value value for the shell group. Um, end of the day, everything comes with a cost. We know that um, whether we're in, whether we're giving our operators an uh, an iPad and an intrinsically safe case, or we're deploying something much more broad and impactful like a digital twin, nothing comes for free. Um, I think, but this, you know, ultimately this does tie back into this you know, this question. What we said, uh, we the oil and gas is a very conservative. Uh, industry, um, and I think Pasim said it really nicely earlier. Uh, I probably can't build on that, but apart from the fact that we have legacy, legacy processes, we're very conservative to change the way we work. So when it comes to real disruptive technology like a digital twin, um, it's not cost that's the issue. It's it's around the change management uh, and the people having to adapt to new tools. It's the really 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 big issue. Um, quite often when we get to DRD, DRB boards, though, we, we always get asked, what is the cost? Um, um, we said the same thing now. What is the cost if we don't? Um, you know, the, 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 the industry needs to move. The industry needs to change. You've got, we've, we've, we've got our CEO, uh, CEOs from each of the major companies, including, uh, including uh, um, um, Equinor on here. All our CEOs have got the same ambition move our company into a, a, a net carbon in, uh, um, business before 2050 or before I think we've all got the same ambitions, reduce the cost, make us more sustainable, make us a more uh, uh, an, an active player in the energy market, be transparent with the way that we produce and distribute our uh, energy across the supply chain. Um, digital twins are going to have to do that. We see this probably one of the biggest catalysts for achieving our goals over the next few years and we have to stick with it. So yes, yes, we always, you know, the the when the purse strings have to be uh, loosened, we always get the challenge. And what is this going to cost? Um, we always come with a point of value first. Um, everything has to be ever payback. It has to pay back fast. Every every digital investment we make has to come back in roughly twelve months, if not sooner. Um, when that makes us really focus on where the, the value is going to be, whether it being an operational cost, whether it being our capital efficiency, whether it being in us uh, uh, in safety, or uh, in in reliability, or or overall just you know cash flow from production. Um, so um, yes, it's a cost, but there's a bigger cost if we don't. Very good, thank you. The uh, each of you has been involved in an in instrument uh, instrumental in successful digital twin deliveries for your customers and or your companies and uh, i'm sure the number of folks in the call today who are early in this process in this journey and curious to to maybe get some some guidance on key lessons learned or a, a key piece of advice that might help them uh accelerate and and uh, ensure success a, a little more quickly in this space so I'm going to just go around and, and see if there's uh, a key uh, 
like I said, lesson learned or, or piece of advice you'd give to folks on uh, who are early in the journey to, to help them through the process a little more effectively. And maybe I'll start with you, Vasim. Um, if there's one message, it's communicate widely, communicate deeply. Identify in the organization digital evangelists, people who will sell on your behalf. I think technology is not the issue. The technology is out there. It's the culture of adoption of the technology that's the issue. And I think the, one of the lessons we learned very early on is just because it's brilliant doesn't mean people are going to fall in love with it, which means that we've got to communicate deeply in the organization, identify people who are change leaders, let's say, bring them in as part of the group, and then use them as the lever to gain acceptability of the tool. If you can get a core group of these digital evangelists, as I call them, to accept the technology, and we can prove very quickly how life becomes easy, how you can move to more value-added work rather than doing a more mundane task, um, we find that adoption is much easier. So if there's one lesson I want to leave the audience is don't try and do everything yourself. Involve as many people as you can, but communicate, communicate, communicate. That's a brilliant message. The uh, I love the concept of, of grassroots behavioral change management and uh, yeah. pairing that perhaps with top-down initiatives. That's a really important aspect. Um, Harold, how about how about you? What are, what are uh, some of your perspectives think, and, and uh, advice? I think um, my my most important learning, at least from 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 our journey, was that. <clears throat> the the biggest value was not found where we thought we would find it um, because and we discovered this through small and frequent releases to the end users and uh, also uh, talking a lot to the end users we went to the step of taking our development team since we were doing this internally we took all the developers and 16 of them and put them on helicopters and flew them out to the oil uh, up and dropped them off in the middle of the installation, gave them an iPad with the digital twin installed and a list of tasks, and then just stepped back and, and, and saw what happened. And that, that made the developers much more uh, posi much better positioned to, to talk to the end users when the end users were trying to explain something to them. And it also enabled the end users to show what they were doing and, and what they were their priorities, what they need this week, next week, and the week after to, to gain value from this digital twin. So this ability to release new functionality often was uh, one of the key things we learned because then we could release, get feedback, change course, get feedback, and continuously see what gave value to the end users. And I think that was one of the things that made our journey a success. Because then when the new assets or when other assets were coming in, we could point to what we'd done on the first uh, couple of assets and show that, yeah, this is the way we think it should work in, in Equinor. And, and you get the, these capabilities. And if those are not enough for you, we can develop more capabilities if you need it. So the, those small steps. Uh, and I just want to say one more thing around this business case thing. Uh, when we started out, this uh, digital twins was a fairly immature concept. So it was impossible for us to give any business case. So we just went on, uh, we went on instinct and idea. And, and then we proved it uh, along the way, uh, which is uh, another way of, of doing it. If you don't have the numbers, because the numbers can be misleading. They, they can give a false sense of accuracy where it doesn't really exist. Very good, Harold. So I, I think what you're saying is to to put your IT department in a helicopter and fly them to a to the nearest crude unit to get to get grounded yep. in what they, what they need to develop. <laughs> Very good, uh, Shane. How about you? Um, look, every, I echo everything that's been said here. You know, but one of the things we've 
realize is don't be afraid to start. Everyone, everyone just builds themselves up and tries to plan and plan and plan, but just don't be afraid to start. The value will be realized. You know, this is what Harold is talking about. You know, um, you know, it's 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 it, it, it might not be measurable from day one, and it never is. It rarely is, but it, it it will happen, and we know this. Digitalization and in particular, digital twins are going to be central to achieving. You know your decarbonization uh, pledges and commitments, uh, your optimization and cost focus. We know and we've proven this time and time again over the last few years that you can actually realize this. So don't be afraid to start. Include people early, right? It's, I know we work in a conservative industry. I'm, I'm a process engineer. I've walked the lines of walk systems, but I've been working with technology and software for most, most of my career, all in oil and gas industry. And even though we're conservative, the amount of enthusiastic people we've met with, with our various uh, users, it, it's just been phenomenal, you know. So do include these people early to become your evangelists, you know. So don't silo these projects just to a few people, maybe in your IT departments, you know. In, you know, find those uh, people who are enthusiastic. And I'm not talking about just having young people. We, 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 have, we have a 55-year-old operator that just loves the digital twin. He, he just says, you know, I will never go back to where I work uh, before. And this is a person who's worked in one facility for nearly 30 years of his career and you know complete surprise that he was this uh, evangelist and adopted to it you will have the laggards but the more early adopters and fast followers that you get on board um, the more this is going to be successful from an adoption point of view so include people early uh, to echo them what Harold said you have to run this agile you have to run it as an iterator process so we do the exact same thing we we, we, we do two week sprints we have um, sprint demos where we present this to various people uh, depending on the end user say we're doing something on, on maintenance for example we have all the maintenance people come in if we're doing something on production optimization we have all those people come in for that sprint um, uh, and of course, we keep the management aligned on what's happening. And it's, it's just amazing because every two weeks they're seeing new features coming. They're seeing new workflow enablement. Um, so you need to really have this agile partnership mentality in place. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I think I'll leave it at there. There, those three things. Don't be afraid to start. Uh, include people and uh, approach this with an iterative, uh, iterative process. Thank you, Shane. It's very good, very good advice. And Luke, uh, in our last two minutes here of the session, you get the the final word on uh, guidance to give to folks who are starting this journey or maybe earlier in the process than Shell. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you you probably heard most of the advice already, which is probably uh, uh, nothing new to people, especially you've already been out there. But a, a leap of faith has to be there. Uh, you're never going to know all the ins and outs you're going to get from the digital twin, and I, and I think it's been it's been heard today, and we've certainly heard it in Shell with our partnership with Kongsberg. That sometimes the benefits the benefits we started out for are not what we end up with. Uh, sometimes we're pleasantly surprised along the way. So if you're going to start, number one, start with the business people. Uh, the people in mind, the users, the people are going to have to live with this day in and day out. You've heard that from Howard, you've heard that from C, you've heard it from Shane, um, and you probably you know those listening on the call are probably saying, yeah, we do that as well. Um, find yourself a good uh, a, a good partnership um, that are going to grow with you. Um, Shell are a great company. We're not an, we're, we're, we're not an IT company, um, but we you know we've learned to partner and deep partnerships with with some of the big players out there, including Kongsberg. So with with really really benefited from these partnerships uh, and these partnerships where that is, where you heard from Harold, you've got the developers, the people who are actually creating the digital twin hand in hand with the people they're going to be using and i think that's probably been the most empowering thing about our, our change journey over, over the last 18 to 24 months uh and 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 and, and finally and finally it's probably don't be scared to say this doesn't work there's you know there's elements of this this not working let's stop that let's pivot to something else um where we do see value and move on um quite often we see initiatives that you know that, that are too big to fail so um, the great thing about a digital twin and an iterative process is that it is an iterative process and that after your first couple of sprints and if it is not working your way, well, there's always another use case to go after. There's always more value that's that's in the funnel. So go after it. Um, so partnerships, do it together, find your right pair and, and, uh, um, and be scared, don't be scared to uh, to move on to uh, um, different use cases. So hope that wraps things great. up. Find a good partner to journey with. Good advice for digital twin and and in life, in general. Uh, Luke, Shane, Basim, Harold, 
Thank you very much for your time today. It was a great discussion. Appreciate all your insights. Thank you. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll wrap up the session. Thank you.